kinds of things. Um, I'm Abby Wolf. Good afternoon. I'm the executive director of the Hutchins Center, and it's a pleasure to welcome you here on this sunny and very cold afternoon. I hope you wore your gloves before because my hands were numb outside. Um, if we promise this conversation between um, Professor Henry Louis Gates Jr., the director of the Hutchins Center, and the Alphonse Fletcher University professor at Harvard University, and Sarah Ladipo. Correct. Ladipo. Ladipo. Manika promises to be sparkling. They're one, both wonderful conversationalists and wonderful writers, and we're so pleased to have them here together. They'll be speaking about Sarah's most recent book, Between Starshine and Clay, Conversations from the African Diaspora, and Harvard Bookstore has a table set, up, set outside the Hip Hop Archive um, where you can purchase copies of the book, so please, please do that. Sarah Ladipo Manika is a writer of novels, short stories, and essays translated into several languages. She's the author of the best-selling novel, Independence, and the multiple shortlisted novel, Like a Mule Bringing Ice Cream to the Sun. Her short stories and essays have appeared in publications including Granta, The Guardian, The Washington Post, and the Hutchins Center Own Transition Magazine, among others. The Booker Prize-winning author Bernardine Evaristo notes that notes the transcontinental and transcultural expansive, expansiveness of her prose. I would add to this beautiful and most apt description that her writing has an undeniable and unrelenting powerful grace about it as well. Named one of the 100 most influential Africans by New African in 2022, Sarah has served on a number of nonprofit boards, including as, chair, as board chair for the Women's Writing Residency, Hedgebrook, and as board director for the Museum of the African Diaspora in San Francisco, where the series of conversations that are in this book took shape. She's been a judge for the Goldsmiths Prize, California Book Awards, Aspen Words Literary Prize, and Chair of Judges for the Pan-African Etisalat Prize. Sarah is a San Francisco Library Laureate, an Audi finalist, a Mary Carswell McDowell Fellow, and a Fellow of the Royal Society of Arts. She is also, I'm very proud to say, the newest member of the National Advisory Board of the Hutchins Center, All right. where she and her husband James have... Oh. <laughs> And at the Hutchins Center, she and her husband James have created the JMD Manika Fellowship to support artists and scholars of the Zimbabwean diaspora. This fellowship is just one symbol of Sarah's deep and abiding commitment to the arts and to the life of the mind. This commitment is beautifully on display in her most recent book, Between Starshine and Clay, Conversations from the African Diaspora. Without further ado, please join me in welcoming Sarah Ladipo Manika to the Hutchins Center this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you so much, Abby. <clears throat> and thanks to each of you uh, for coming, particularly three people who came all the way down Massachusetts Avenue from MIT. Be, <laughs> be nice to them, everyone. Be nice to them. Sarah, you're one of the, the most attentive listeners. Um, listening is an act of generosity. And you are, in so many ways, a generous person. But we're here today to hear you speak on this brilliant uh, collection of interviews you conducted, literally across the African diaspora. And to be a good interviewer, one must be an uh, attentive listener. However, by way of introduction to your new friends assembled here today, I'm would you share a bit about your own uh, diaspora story? Well, first of all, thank you so much, Skip, for being in conversation with me. Thank you, Ab Abby, for that lovely introduction. And to everyone who's come on a Friday afternoon, it's great to see you all. Now, what was the question? What Who are you? you? Who are your people? <laughs> <laughs> I always ask guests so, of finding your roots. The first I mean, question. after you've praised my you know, good listening skills. Yeah, we are. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> What's my diaspora story? So I think maybe it, I would describe it as having two parts. Uh, biographical, uh, I've lived in, grew up in Nigeria where my father's from and spent some time in Kenya and then uh, spent some time in Europe, in England and France and um, 
re most recently the United States. And so these are, um, and, and also some time in Zimbabwe where my husband James is from. So these are locations, people in this book are generally from one of those places. Um, so there's a lived experience I've had of living within Africa and in the African diaspora. And then uh, a scholarly experience, I, I guess, um, studying about the diaspora, studying African history and African literature, um, teaching. So uh, those two sides um, probably are where my passion for anything related to the African diaspora stems from. But a um, very general answer, um, my friend. Oh, um, Professor Gates. No, no, not many specifics. I'm not going to let you get away with, with that. When, when, guests, when I sit down with guests of Finding Your Roots, first thing I, oh. I ask them is, um, who are your people? Uh -huh. When people, I know people look at you, look at your name, look at you, and say, who are your people? Yeah. How do you respond? You are my people. Y'all, y'all are my people. Uh -huh. um, so any, anyone, yeah, get specific. Um, anyone who has that same passion and interest in Africa and the African diaspora, and you know, we all humans ultimately come from Africa. Uh -huh. um, yeah, that's a difficult question. Mm. Hmm. Who are your people? Hey, this is my show. I don't, I don't. <laughs> so you're you're biracial. I am. So, yeah. so uh, I'm like you, fifty percent. Fifty percent. So fifty percent what? Fifty percent. Oh, but you know, fifty percent white, fifty percent black, fifty percent West African, English, fifty percent English. So your mom was English. Yes. And your father's uh, Nigerian. Nigerian. Yes. And uh, drilling down more. Your father's uh, night, uh, Europe. You, yes, that's and, right. And where's your mom from in England? So my mom is from the north. She's from uh, a city called York. Um, and I remember I, growing up in Nigeria, I went to an American missionary school. And every time I would say that my mother was from New York, York it would be corrected to New York. <laughs> 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 like, no. Um, yeah. So. Well, when, <coughs> when you were asked about your identity, uh, in school. Was it awkward for you? Did you have, my friend Anthony Oppie, whom, whom you know, my best friend, mm -hmm. always had a pat answer, and I'm not going to tell you what his answer uh, mm -hmm. was. I'm curious about how you dealt with that in school, and if it was uncomfortable. Well, I think when I was younger, and I, I probably allude to this in the introductory chapter, you know, I was referred to as Oyimbo, so, which literally means in Pidgin English, peeled skin, mm -hmm. pale skin. White, so white person. White, yeah. So in Nigeria, I was white. And then when I would visit my grandparents in the north of England, in York, I was, I was not white. Right. I, w I was colored at that time. And then coming to the States, I'm black. So, you know, different conceptions, different social constructions of race. Um, and so as a child, I think, you know, one wants to fit in. I mean, it was not just the fact that I was a uh, different color to the majority of people, but I was also a pastor's kid. I uh, wore glasses, was very short-sighted. So, you know, so I stood out in a lot of different ways. In, in every um, African-American autobiography, and even starting in the slave narratives, in the slave narratives, there's a moment when, say, Frederick Douglass or Harriet Jacobs, um, whomever, it's consistent, when they find out that they're a slave. So you, the point was to say you're not born a slave, that being a slave is a socially, socially constructed identity. Mm -hmm. And it's absolutely the case in uh, black autobiography. Mm -hmm. There's a moment when you discover that you're black. Mm -hmm. And generally, it's a painful experience. Mm -hmm. What was yours? Mm -hmm. Did you undergo that experience? And for you, I'm curious, did you, was it a mirrored experience? In Nigeria, did you have a, an experience discovering that you're mixed? And then in England, did you have the uh, experience discovering that you were colored? Would you share that with us, please? Yeah, and I, I write a little bit about this in the introductory chapter. So yes, discovering that I'm white initially, <laughs> or conceived as, as other and different and an outsider in Nigeria. And then as I write about in this chapter, when I go to England as a teenager, um, I 
I'm finding <coughs> that there are black people in England who have never lived in Africa, but they claim an African heritage. They, they refer to themselves as African, and so this is new to me. So kind of you know, coming to terms with the way that different people both categorize themselves and the way that societies categorize them. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, and then coming to America and taking some years to understand the way that uh, the racial history of America, you know, there are people like you, Skip and Morrison and Baldwin that I really feel that I learned so much about America. I learned about this, the history of this country and the history of race. Um, and so a nod to Baldwin, I entitled that introductory chapter, Notes of a Native Daughter. Mm -hmm. um, because Baldwin, Baldwin really speaks to me both as a writer, you know, he talks about trying to write sentences as clean as a bone. Mm -hmm. He speaks to me as someone who has had a Pan-African experience. He lived in different places, including France, where I've lived, and so I identify with that. And he writes about the different places that he's lived in and the different experiences of um, being a black person in different parts of the world. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, I mean, I can go on and on about Baldwin, but the, ba the wisdom that Baldwin has, the wisdom of holding on to two separate things that might seem contradictory. Um, mm -hmm. So remaining committed to the struggle against injustices while keeping your heart free of hatred and despair. Mm -hmm. So, um, Did you yeah. have an N-word experience in England? Um, yes, I am sort of pondering in England, in France, here in the States, um, and I write about the experience in France, which was a variant of an N-word experience um, being perceived and attacked as, because uh, I appear to be Arab. Right, and Algerian. Yeah, right. yeah. Um, but would you share that? I mean, people haven't read your introduction. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. They will, because yeah. we'll make them, they won't be able to get out of this without buying Yeah, well, I, I, mean, I think <laughs> just, just, just quickly, the, the anecdote in um, France was when I spent a year at the University of Bordeaux, and I was taking, I was coming from town back to campus in the middle of the day, and I was waiting for a bus, and a group of, um, so I would have referred to them as skinheads at that time, came up and started speaking to me in French and um, telling me to go back, and I was you know, a dirty Arab, and it was one of those situations where I found myself not quite knowing what to do, because on one hand I want to say I'm not Arab, I'm not Moroccan, I'm not <laughs> Algerian, but then that's actually not the point. Um, you know, and I'm certainly so not one of them. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, but then I think the the hard part about that was this was the middle of the day. People were passing. Nobody stopped, mm -hmm. um, and feeling very, very vulnerable. And just the arbitrariness of um, you know racial discrimination and attacks. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter whether I'm Arab or not. Um, right. I'm just uh, a, a color, a shade that is disliked. Mm. Yeah. How old were you when you had that experience? Early 20s, mm. or 20 maybe. But did you have a childhood experience like that? You know, I'm trying to think. I mean, I, I guess the childhood experience is knowing that my grandparents disowned my mother because she married a black man. Mm -hmm. And uh, but always feeling and hoping, and this was probably nurtured by my parents, by my mother, that they were just, it was of their generation, they didn't know any better, they were naive, and they would come round, which they did to some extent, they came round to embracing the grandchildren, but still sort of didn't forgive the parents. Right. Yeah. And did the parents forgive the, the grandparents? Mum and dad who were listening, yes, they did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. they did. <laughs> it's a very tough thing. Yeah. My first wife was a white American, and um, her parents, um, effectively disowned her until we had grandchildren. Mm -hmm. But I never really was comfortable with them. Mm -hmm. You know, it never, you, you like me now. Um, why do you like me now, right? Now, how much do you like me now? Mm -hmm. You know, I never was, mm -hmm. I never forgave that. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was a, a very, very difficult thing. Mm -hmm. So which, you know, we're, we're a nation of boxes, identity boxes. Which mm -hmm. boxes do you check? Mm -hmm. 
black. Yeah. But not black and white. No. Because you. No, and and I think. Um, uh, you know, my mind was slightly lingering on my grandparents. I remember just one little anecdote when my grandmother was um, older and beginning to get have dementia. I remember very vividly her sort of, sort of, it was sort of like a daydream or a nightmare, and she was talking about, you know, a black man who was trying to rape her. And yep. I just like, you know, just like all the stereotypes and things that she must have had, and mm -hmm. just, um, again, just that being very hurtful. Um, but back to the checking of boxes. So, you know, realizing that it, it's fine to identify, you know, I, I, my mother is white, my father is black. So, in, you know, I have both black and white, but in a power structure and, in a, you know, in terms of identifying with um, a group that has faced discrimination and so forth, it's, it's not helpful to say I'm black and I'm, I'm white. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I definitely identify as black. Yeah. Would you say that, uh, for, um, in your experience, as a mixed race person, was it more socially awkward to be mixed in England or in N Nigeria? Socially awkward. It depends where I was, and you know, when you when you're in England, you, one also has to talk about class. Mm -hmm. um, Big time. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, and I think it's more. It, it's more when I think about that childhood. I would think more about age and just wanting to fit in as a young child. That's what kind of was the pre prevailing issue for me as a, as a child, ch children wanting to fit in. Mm -hmm. Was it easier to fit in in England or in Nigeria? Um, I, don't, I don't know if I would give a very objective answer now. I think I, I'm very nostalgic perhaps about my childhood, so mm -hmm. looking back, it feels that I was fitting in more, but I think, um, I think it, it was equally challenging, to be honest. Really? Yeah. Oh, that's fascinating. You're digging really <laughs> deep, and I'm still <laughs> keeping it a little general. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not, uh, you see, she's a good interviewer, and I like to think I am too. <laughs> You are. You're but, excellent. But this is what she did yeah. to me, you see. So <laughs> turnabout is fair play. And she did to me in front of a zillion people all the way in Africa. And I'm not letting you get away with these vague, vague answers, uh, dear Sarah. All right, dear Skip. And these are questions that, uh, of course, I've explored with Anthony up here. Anthony would say, just straight up, my mother is English, my father is Ghanaian. Mm. That was, boom. That mm -hmm. was his only... Mm -hmm. Uh, answer. I don't know if he checks both boxes anymore. I, well, but we should ask. Yeah, but he, uh, <laughs> uh, he's probably written about him, and I don't remember. But for all of those, for all, um, th those of you who haven't read um, Sarah's marvelous book uh, yet, I want to ask this. Tell us why, hi, come on in. Tell us why you chose this curious title, a title that I find very poetic, Between Starshine and clay. Mm. Well, I love titles that make me think. And so my second novel in particular, well, both novels, but the second novel has a very long title, like a mule bringing ice cream to the sun. And that was uh, a line and, or two lines from a poem. And similarly, I was reading poetry as I was finishing the edits on this book. And I was reading uh, Lucille Clifton's, some of her poems. And I came across her poem, Won't You Celebrate With Me? Mm -hmm. And I think I know it off by heart, so it's a short poem, I'll, I'll recite it. But I'll just say before I recite it, I felt that it was a poem that really encapsulated the people that I was looking at in this book. So the book is a combination of essays and conversations. So essays that um, I've written about people over a period of time, and then the, the one one moment conversation, so Skip is one of those, uh, just one conversation. Um, so the, the poem goes like this, won't you celebrate with me? Won't you celebrate with me what I have shaped into a kind of life? I had no model, born in Babylon, both non-white and woman. What did I see to be except myself? I made it up 
Here on this bridge between starshine and clay, my one hand holding tight my other hand, come celebrate with me that every day something has tried to kill me and has failed. So for me, this, as I said, encapsulated and epitomized the 12 amazing people that I'm writing about, so, um, or I'm, I'm in conversation with. And the way that I like to sort of summarize the book is it's a sharing of 12 intimate conversations with some of our leading thinkers of our time, of which um, Skip, of course, is at the center there. And, um, you know, these are all people, they come from different parts of the world, from America, Europe, Africa, or part of the African diaspora. And none of them had a map. None of them, they, they've all kind of made it up in amazing ways. And some of these people you'll know of, like Skip, like Toni Morrison, Michelle Obama. Others, some people will have heard of, like uh, the ordinary pastor turned civil rights activist, Evan Mawariri from Zimbabwe, um, documentarian. Um, she's won uh, Peabody and BAFTAs, but people perhaps don't know her name, Poli Swasitole. Um, and then there's Willard Harris, who is my neighbor. She's 103 years young. Mm -hmm. And she was the first black head of nurses in a major California hospital. So, so from people that you'll have heard of and people you won't uh, necessarily have heard of, None of them, even someone like Michelle Obama, you know, she was, she was the first. A lot of these are the first, the first. Um, and they have carved this incredible path in their respective fields. And it leaves us with really something to celebrate. And, you know, Skip, you're my dear friend, but really, yeah, I find myself talking about you. It's hard because I want to like talk about all 12, but I talk about you a lot because you have done so, so much. Um, paved, paved the way, made it up. I mean, set up, set up, up at this incredible institution of African and African American studies. Your films are extraordinary. I don't know how many books you've written, and I mean, I've lost count and, and co-edited, and just all that you have done and built is absolutely phenomenal. And and you know, so you're one of the more well-known names, but even then. In my opinion, <laughs> you're not well known enough. <laughs> um, you know, so it's it's, and these are all people that have inspired me over the years, and people that I'm lucky enough to have got to know in different ways over time. Um, you know, some, uh, you know, Skip and I in different settings from our various homes to we play the dozens on email. You always have the last word. <laughs> um, to someone like Tony Morrison, who I only got to meet in person once but, and spent an afternoon in, at her home, but I feel that there were many other encounters over time as I read her work, as I taught her work, as I listened to other interviews. And Toni Morrison uh, did not suffer fools, uh, gladly. Um, she didn't l allow many people to come into her home. It's quite a compliment. Thank you for the, your very kind um, words. For me, you know, it's uh, my motto, Satchel Page's motto. Um, Satchel, Satchel Page was a great black uh, baseball player. And it was like, don't look back, something might be gaining on you. <laughs> Gotta keep on, uh, keep on moving. But what do these people have in common? Why these uh, a dozen people? Why them? Well, I think, you know, again, going back to, I mean, I chose these 12 because in the last couple of years, in different ways, they've all inspired me a lot. Um, I, uh, and I want to talk about the Holy Trinity. There's a Holy Trinity in this book, which is mm -hmm. Morrison, Gates, and Sri Lanka, but we'll come to that in a second. <laughs> um, I, you know, all my life, I have thought a lot about art, the importance of art, and the role that art plays in society. I've thought a lot about history, what histories are told, what, what histories are not told, who curates histories, how, it, how it's curated, and um, I thought a lot about progress. Um, what is the nature of progress? Is it kind of two steps forward, one step back? And, um, and so I chose to uh, structure the book into three parts, which is one focusing on the artists, the creatives, one focusing on the, the curators, historians, and then a last category of, of change makers. Now the Holy Trinity, which is 
um, Toni Morrison and uh, Skip Gates and Wally Shoyinka, in my opinion. I, I call them the Holy Trinity because they, they're all three. I mean, the, many of the people in this cover various categories, but you're a creative, you're a curator, you're definitely a, a change maker. And one of the things that I love about this collection is that there, there's, you know, Toni Morrison talks about Wale Shoyinka. Wale Shoyinka and um, Skip Gates are talking and they, you know, Wale Shoyinka is talking about Toni Morrison. So that's just kind of another level of story and tales that I feel that I've missed and that I um, was really happy to have come up in the book. Shoyinka was my professor at the University of Cambridge. Without Shoyinka, I wouldn't be here. I would have been a medical doctor or a lawyer. Um, and Toni Morrison, when I was a baby professor at Yale, Toni had a year-to-year a -year, uh, re renewable appointment, which was not renewed after two years hmm. in the program in Afro-American studies. This was Toni of the Bluest Eye uh, before Song of Solomon. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. Toni of Su the Bluest Eye and Sulu mm -hmm. before Song of Solomon. Mm -hmm. And her office was next to mine. And I used to, you know, she would drive up and then drive back. She was a prominent editor at Random House mm -hmm. and well respected, mm -hmm. but she was not Toni Morrison. Mm -hmm. No one would have predicted that she would be mm -hmm. the first African American mm -hmm. uh, to win the no to win mm -hmm. the Nobel Prize. Mm -hmm. So it's very I had an interesting relationship with both of them. I wouldn't say I was intimate with Tony at all, but I knew her and I knew her at, at a, a a very important uh, time in, in my life and admired her very much and watched her mm -hmm. meteoric rise mm -hmm. uh, in the literary profession. Mm -hmm. And Choyinka, of course, is my other best friend, as mm -hmm. you well, very mm -hmm. well know. So it's an honor. The mm -hmm. difference between Tony Morrison and, and Wally Schenk on one hand and Henry Louis Gates Jr. is called the Nobel Prize. <laughs> <laughs> Yours is coming. It's I don't coming. think, uh, the phone ringing? <laughs> Gotta keep that cell phone on all night long. <laughs> October, October. Uh, that's <laughs> never going to happen. Before we go back, uh, and it's an honor to be uh, considered even in, in the, the same breath with, with the two of them. But I, I'm, I'm just, can, if I can interrupt, just sure. tagging onto what you were saying about Morrison, sort of before she became famous. Um, one of the things that I write about in Margaret Busby's chapter, so Margaret Busby is, was the youngest ever publisher in England and the first black woman publisher and has just done amazing things, including putting together Daughters of Africa, New Daughters of Africa, which are two phenomenal anthologies bringing writings of black women together mm -hmm. um, over the centuries. And um, she, when in, as I was preparing to go and talk to Toni Morrison, I reached out to Margaret because I remember Margaret saying that she had interviewed, she'd been in conversation, recorded it for film, for Channel 4, I think. Um, this is before Toni was well known. Uh, or before she won the Nobel. And Channel 4 never ran the interview oh. that Margaret and Tony had. So, you know, Margaret kindly shared it with me. But, the, you know, again, these, in terms of archives, um, that, that, that was never shown. And Not even after no. the Nobel Prize? What's she going to do with it? No. Well, I think you should talk about Yeah. Do you have archive. a number? I'll call her a dinner. Yeah. yeah but there you go. You <laughs> <laughs> who, do you, who do you write? through. You know, every writer um, has other subtexts that they're writing and rewriting. Um, the first black writer I ever uh, read was James Baldwin. Mm -hmm. And I was given, uh, uh, James Baldwin, as far as I'm concerned, was an average novelist, but a genius essayist. And uh, playwright, again, so-so, but a genius uh, essayist. And I was at an Episcopal church camp, the Anglican church. You're familiar with the Anglican church, I do believe. Oh, yes. A little preacher's uh -huh. kid. Yeah. DK. Pastor's, yeah. pastor's right, kid right, in England. All right, all right, all right. Uh, yeah, pastor's no. kid in Nigeria, right? Yeah. We yeah. call him preacher's kid, P okay. PK. Okay. Um, so same church, the Anglican communion. And it was August of 1965, which was the summer of the Watts riots. And I was 14 years I was on the eve of my 15th birthday. Mm -hmm. And... Um, I had been raised in my mother's church, a Methodist church. Mm -hmm. And I've written about this, you know, but most mm -hmm. people don't. Mm -hmm. um, and um, between the ages of 12 and 14, I was a, 
I accepted Jesus as my savior. I didn't go to basketball games, which I loved. I didn't dance, which I loved. I didn't listen to rock and roll music. It was a very strict church, and I did that in a bargain with God because my mother was sick, and I made a deal with Jesus that if she didn't die, I would give my life to Christ. So I'll change the subject before I start to cry. So, but when I was 14, my, um, Zora Neale Hurston has a, a marvelous phrase that um, the, uh, her anthropology, anthropological training at Columbia was fitting her too tight like a girdle. And the church, the beliefs in this church were fitting me too tight um, like a, an ill-sized um, girdle. I mean, I had the same mind that I have today, and I was worshiping with people who believed the world had been created in seven days and that it actually wasn't Adam and Eve. They didn't know about um, metaphor or uh, figurative language. So I was feeling like a hypocrite. And my brother was in dental school, and he came home, and he said, this is ridiculous. You're going to this crazy church. I'm going to take you to a movie. And I, hadn't, and I loved the movies. And I hadn't been to a movie in two years. And he took me to see Hard Day's Night. And when I came out, I th really, Sarah, I thought a bolt of lightning was going to come out of the sky. <laughs> and, but it felt good. You know, I knew I was never going to go back to that church in the same way after I saw a hard day's night. So my father was an Episcopalian. And I decided I didn't want to give up um, my beliefs in God, but I didn't want to be a hypocrite in that church. So I switched to the Episcopal church, right? Mm -hmm. So they sent me um, to the a diocesan church camp, a summer camp, and it was great. And right in the middle occurred the, the Watts riots. Mm -hmm. And we were cut off from newspapers. Remember, this is 1965. Mm -hmm. So the Sunday paper was brought from the local town along with milk and eggs and things like that. Mm -hmm. So I was walking through this church camp, and I saw all the white kids. There were only three black, I mean, how many black Episcopalians are even today, let alone in West Virginia? Back in 1965, there were 102 kids at the camp and three black kids. So all the white kids were in a circle. And as the closer, as I approached this group, they stopped talking, they all looked at me. So I knew it had to be something about race, just um, unconsciously I knew that. And when I walked into the circle, they showed me a paper that said Negroes riot in Watts. So I did not know what a riot was. Mm -hmm. I did not know if that meant white people were killing black people mm -hmm. or black people were killing white people. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know where Watts was. <clears throat> so it was very confusing and very unsettling, mm -hmm. very, very awkward. In mm -hmm. the way, I don't know about mm -hmm. um, you and your schooling, mm -hmm. but um, for us, and I went to white schools my mm -hmm. whole life, mm -hmm. integrated school, we call it the white school. Um, when anything black, and that was very rare, everybody would look at us. You know, you, you were the voice of the black mm -hmm. community, which mm -hmm. was horrible. When we say about slavery, how ignorant our ancestors were in Africa, they were mm -hmm. savages, they were primitive, they didn't have clothes, mm -hmm. they would all look at us. And it was, and it was awkward. Slavery was the best thing that ever happened uh, to our African ancestors because they were primitive and ugly and naked and mm -hmm. et cetera, et cetera. Again, uh, this was horrible, right? So I was in that zone, and I'd been in that zone before, but I, and I didn't know uh, what the landscape was in that zone. And that night, an Episcopal priest from New England, surprise, surprise, gave me a copy of Nobody Knows My Name. Mm -hmm. And there was this black man staring at me on the cover. Mm -hmm. And it took me a while to figure out that that was a, a, a photograph of the man whose name was on the title page. And it was mm -hmm. James Baldwin. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I kept a commonplace book, and you all know a commonplace book is a notebook when you write down. When you start it, it's because some author has named an emotion or a thought mm -hmm. that you didn't even know you had. Mm -hmm. Something that was beautiful, like you felt, uh, the way you felt about Lucille Clifton's mm -hmm. uh, poem. Mm -hmm. Or just articulated a, a sentiment or an insight. Mm -hmm. But James Baldwin, I basically transcribed it, hmm. his paragraphs. Hmm. Each of us helpfully, helplessly and uh, forever, you know, that's one of it. He used commas like mm -hmm. that and dashes mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. all the time. Each of, each of us, comma, helplessly and forever, comma, contains the other. 
male, male and female, female and male, female and male, white and black, black and white. We are a part of each other. Many of my country, countrymen, find this, this fact exceedingly inconvenient and even unfair. And so, very often, do I. But none of us can do anything at all about it. There are a dozen commas in what I just said. <laughs> he was addicted to commas, and so I became addicted to commas. All of this is a long-winded way of saying, who was in your commonplace book? Hmm. Who did you imitate? Who do you imitate now? Who do you write out of? Hmm. Well, I'll come to that in a minute, but as you're talking, you know, when we started the conversation and you're asking about identity and racial identity, it struck me as you were talking that when I was younger, the fact that my father was a pastor and we lived in a very multi-faith environment and also a multi-ethnic environment and we were Yoruba and you know, it wasn't very long after the Biafran War. And so those, those aspects of identity, the religious identity and the ethnic identity were probably stronger, at least in Nigeria, um, than race. So just as you were, you were speaking, I'm like, okay, so that's why I was kind of you know, finding it kind of hard, maybe I was generalizing a little bit because actually there were other facets of identity sure. that um, I felt uh, just as strongly, if not more strongly about. Um, but in terms of... Uh, right, know, if you live in a place where everybody black, what's black? Being yeah. Yorba mm -hmm. as opposed to Igbo mm -hmm. or Hausa, much more important. I mean, you, you won't... Africans become black when Europeans show up or when they go to Africa, uh, when they go to Europe. Yeah. So absolutely. Um, but Baldwin, I mean, I, I, I want, my, my tendency is I want to hear more about your meeting with Baldwin as well in France. With Not a chance, yeah, I lady. Know, I know. <laughs> <laughs> it's much more interesting. But Baldwin certainly, as I've said earlier, has just such an influence. And um, I, I'm with you as well. I love his work, but it's his essays that I'm drawn to the most. And they just are timeless. And I have learned so much from him and just what, just so quick, uh, just the way he speaks and so quick with thought. And I, mean, I think he talks about how, you know, writers, we figure things out as we're writing things. So we're not that good, or some of us are not that good at kind of coming up with answers on the spot. But he was both. He was, yeah, um, he was, yeah, he was. Yeah, so <laughs> Baldwin, when it comes to essays and really, again, trying to write as clean as a bone. I, I sort of look at my pencil and I think about that all the time. Um, Toni Morrison, the, the talking books, the orality of her work is something. Oh, jazz is a talking book. Yeah. yeah. My, my favorite. Yeah. 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 Um, so, and then honestly, Skip, I mean, just list, I've always been an inveterate eavesdropper, maybe as a pastor's kid, like listening to conversations. And also as a child, you people forget that you're there. But all, I mean, I can't just say just as a child, even as an adult, I'm just, I hear a snippet of conversation and I'll, I'll wonder, well, what happened before that? And what happened <laughs> after that? Um, so just the everyday listening to conversations, the way people phrase things, um, here I'm going to come to Anna Devere Smith, the way people hold themselves and carry yeah. themselves in their bodies, that tells a story as well. So I'm always watching and listening. And do you go yeah. home and write down snippets of conversations? I do. I also just, I tend to use my voice app. Um, I'll just record something or, or note something using voice, yeah. Uh -huh. Faulkner, mm. I think it was Faulkner, used to come home and say, no, maybe it was not Faulkner, maybe it was... Uh, Maybe it was um, Thomas Mann. I can't remember. But or maybe it'll come to me at dinner. Mm -hmm. But he would come home and tell his wife, just, tell, just talk to me. Mm. Just tell me what happened. Mm. No matter how mundane. Mm. Just tell me. And, and then he would write it down. Mm. And he, he got a lot of his storylines and also dialogue. Mm -hmm. um, uh, listening to voice. Okay, mm -hmm. Desert Island Disc. Oh. Desert Island Disc. You have three. Who is it? You know, I want to be the host of Desert Island Disc. Isn't that audacious? Well, you could do that. We could arrange it. We okay. could start. We could start the American. There's no equivalent. <laughs> Tell people what Desert Island Disc is. Okay, 
Kirsty Young is the best. I mean, I'm sorry to Lauren Laverne, who's the current host. I mean, she's good as well, but Kirsty Young was amazing. So Desert Island is, has been running for over 70 years. It's a BBC uh, radio program. And the premise of it is they, you have a guest that comes in, and the premise is that you're cast away to a desert island. And what seven tracks, maybe it's seven or eight, I can't remember, would you take with you if you were cast away to this desert island? And you know, then you can also take a luxury item and you can also take a, a book. Um, you're given the complete works of Shakespeare and in the past it was the Bible, but now you can take any other faith book with you. And it's, you know, music is such, it, it brings up nostalgia and it's often, for, many, for most people, it's a way of sort of narrating their life. And I just love it. I'm just drawn to people's life stories, even people that I don't know of. I'm the combination of someone talking about their life and talking about music and what an appropriate thing to be saying in this, the hip hop archive <laughs> um, is just so compelling and wonderful. And, you know, I, I was looking at some of the archives. Um, Paul Robeson was on in 1957, really? I think. Yeah, but they've lost they don't have his interview, which is, uh, or the conversation, which oh, um, I would have loved. You, they, they, you, they've listed the songs that he chose and his luxury item. Do you know what his luxury item was? Uh, you know, hmm? What would you have guessed? Um, I started to say Cadillac would be funny. <laughs> <laughs> um, a fountain pen. It's a good guess. Ren many people take pens. A Benin bronze. Really? Yeah. Wow. So for me, that was just like, oh, the, the Pan-African spirit. Yeah. Yeah. Um, he wrote yeah. an essay. He studied at um, the School of uh, Oriental and African Studies, SOAS, mm -hmm. uh, in 1929 and wrote, uh, well, no, I don't know exactly the years, but it was in the 20s. Right, right. And he, he said that he was a polyglot, that he was just gifted and he picked up these African languages. Mm -hmm. So as at one time, taught more African languages than any place in the world. Now mm -hmm. it's Harvard. So as a number two, I'm very proud to say. Right. But he wrote and published an essay in The Spectator called, I Want to Be an African. Mm -hmm. And it, uh, it's a short essay, but it's very much, uh, it's, it predicts uh, negritude. Mm -hmm. It's very much, negritude is first articulated in Paris by Amé Césaire and uh, Leopold Senghor yeah. in 34. Okay. So it's five yeah. years later. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so it's almost like um, a precy of what negative yeah. would, would yeah. become. So he was yeah. very conscious of yeah. his uh, African yeah. heritage, but that's astonishing. Yeah. So how about yours? Yeah. Again, you can't answer a question with a question. <laughs> you have to answer the so question. So I'm thinking about the estimable Gates. The estimable, and, and, yes. the estimable. And, and <laughs> All that you know. My great great grandmother's <laughs> obituary, uh, which I was shown by my father when I was nine years old, uh, she died on January 6, 1888. And it said, Died this day in Cumberland, Maryland, Jane Gates, an estimable colored woman. See, what she just did is called intertextuality. <laughs> intertextuality. So that words carry um, meaning with them when you lift it from one text and plop it down in another, and that's just what she did. It makes stories simultaneous. It's repetition. And repetition in music, like light motifs, bring the, you know, make, make the, the list, the, the tune you're listening to the belt con continuous, simultaneous. And, it bring, and words do in a text too. And it brings all the emotions that you felt the first time along with it each time and just keeps repeating. So well done. So now answer the question. <laughs> <laughs> Estimably. <laughs> the question about what I would mind. What a mind desert mind. island yeah. is. <laughs> no, 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 not that at all. Yes, of course. What would you take with you on des to desert island disc? What luxury item and what, what book and, uh, and what tune? You don't have to do seven, but you can do whatever. Mm. I'm very interested in what book. I'm very interested in what lu luxury item. It would be one of your books, 
No, it would yeah. not. <laughs> Don't fib in front of your son. Uh, you know, books, it would be poetry. It, it would, would be some, some big, massive something, something of poetry. Not, not Queen Toniva? It no. wouldn't be Tony? No, no, well, I would try and That's what I called her behind her back. She's dead now, so she can't okay. hit me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, maybe it would be the complete works of Toni Morrison, perhaps. No, and you, know, you said poetry first. Yeah, That's poetry. what you meant. Okay, how uh, about a lecture? Uh, um, well, for me, I would, this is a, it'll, you know, when people prepare for Desert Island this, they spend weeks <laughs> thinking through it. <laughs> and you've given me about a second. Well, this is... Sahara Desert Discs. <laughs> <laughs> this is the black version. So this, so this doesn't count. This doesn't count. Uh, oh, I don't know. A, year's, a, a lifelong supply of plantain. So we'll do how about oh, that. Oh, now yeah. you're talking. Yeah, there, yeah, there you yeah, go. Then you, Dodo. You, then you come join me. Right? Dodo, yeah, that's <laughs> right. Dodo. Because I love fried plantain, <laughs> as, as, uh, as she knows. All right. Uh, and OK, three tunes, three recordings. Just three. That's easy. What? Who, who do you listen to? I'm trying to ask. See, I'm doing to you for this audience what you did to all these people, including me. There would have to be a hymn, because you know I'm a pastor's kid. So. What a friend we have in Jesus. Yes, I'm not going to join you. Keep going though. All our <laughs> sins and <laughs> griefs to bear. Which, which, okay, it's like what's how your, great thou, thou art. Oh, you? how great thou art. Yeah. That was my father's favorite. Yeah. And yeah. Billy Graham used that as a theme song. Okay, well. So <laughs> would it be, would it be how, great, how great thou art? Did you say you liked that or not? Uh, yeah, um, because it reminds me of my childhood. Uh-huh. Um, Sings my soul, my Savior God to thee. How great thou art. How great thou art. Okay, I got us off at the wrong tune, but you all did. <laughs> all right, what else? Uh, Were you singing gospel I, in your father's church when he let that sinful, blues-related gospel music creep into the church or not? Um, uh, yes, sort of. Um, you know, I know he's listening, or will be at some point. <laughs> um, I'd have to have a hip-hop. Jules, what would I, what, I'd have to have a hip hop something. What would you, what should I pick? Uh, You're on the spot. You can think about it for a moment. And Jazz, and, and I'm coming out to y'all. Three uh, is not very much. I think probably taking back some of the South Point Latin supply of stuff by Fuji. Something from what? The Fuji. I would say by the Fuji, the Fuji. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that would okay. be good. Yeah. Okay, killing me softly. Okay, what about jazz? Do you like jazz or blues or R and B soul? Love Supreme. The su love su oh, Love Supreme. Culture. That's good. That would be a good choice. There, that's it. Oh, there, yeah, because you said you, the hymn. You, you, yeah. All right. Mm -hmm. How okay. about you? No, I'm not going to let you get away with that. You know, I love the W. E. V. Du Bois Award Ceremony. Oh, yeah? I didn't get a chance to say this to you in our public conversation. Um, it's the best award ceremony in the world. And I've been to the Booker, I've been to a couple, you know, sort of fancy places. And one of the things I love is, is you <laughs> singing. Oh, um, well, right on King Jesus, that's my song. Yeah. That is my, I, that would be mm -hmm. one of mine. Mm -hmm. my, uh, Miles Davis, mm -hmm. kind of blue. Yeah. Uh, I would do that. Right on King Jesus. Mm -hmm. I love the spirituals, mm -hmm. and I love, if I had to pick one, it would be right on King Jesus. Okay. Um, and Precious Lord, Take My Hand by mm -hmm. Thomas Dorsey. Mm -hmm. that, they would be my three. Mm -hmm. uh, see, do, see how I got that? Um, yeah, that was all right. I, I decided to cut you some slack. <laughs> um, Baldwin's essays, mm -hmm. but more the collected Du Bois. Du mm -hmm. Bois was, a, he was, he, he was very lyrical and a deep thinker. Yeah. I wouldn't say James Baldwin was not uh, as profoundly original as a thinker as W.E.B. Du Bois hmm. was. Du Bois hmm. coined two of the guiding metaphors for black literature in the 20th 
the century. Mm -hmm. The metaphor of double consciousness mm -hmm. and the veil. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And that's hard to do, you mm -hmm. know, to, to come up with a metaphor. You know, not he wasn't sitting around, sitting around thinking, I'm going to create a metaphor that everybody's going to use from now till Tony Morrison, who me never heard of, right? But he did. And that's, that's quite astonishing. Uh, so I've started reading a new book um, by, I think, one of your mentees as he came through here, Chad L. Williams, uh -huh. um, The Wounded World uh, uh, on W.E.B. Du Bois' writing on the First World War. Right. And um, Yeah, recently. Yeah, uh, yeah. It's, it's, it comes out in April. Yeah, because I haven't even read it, but I just heard about yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, because yeah. I think you're doing an event with him. You'll yeah. be in conversation, so you'll have read it by then. Yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. That's why yeah. I know about yeah. this. Yes, yeah. absolutely. <laughs> No, and in fact, I agreed to do it because um, I wanted to uh, think about um, yeah, World War One, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And there was a, a documentary recently about uh, the horrors of World War One, mm -hmm. and I think that we've we've mm -hmm. forgotten. When I was a kid, Armistice Day was a big day. School was out, and we had to go to the cemetery when World War One ended. Mm -hmm. um, but now I don't think people um, uh, people uh, have to do that. Mm -hmm. So why are you thinking of that book? Well, because I'm I'm thinking about W. E. B. Du Bois. I feel very I like a, I don't you know I read the Souls of Black Folk a, a while ago, and so I'm just coming back to Du Bois. Uh -huh. um, yeah. So what is it yeah. about Baldwin? You've talked about him, um, but what does he mean to you, and what does he mean to us? Why is he is he relevant? Baldwin went through a period when nobody read him. Mm. Baldwin fell out of favor, and then he came back. Mm -hmm. He fell out of favor after the um, horrible essay that um, Eldridge Cleaver wrote about him and, and um, a homophobic essay in Soul on Ice. Mm -hmm. And then he sort of lost his voice. He lost his, his rhythm. He was trying, I've, I've written about this, this isn't just my opinion, but he was trying to uh, Samuel Johnson, I'm going to paraphrase, mm -hmm. said that so much of human folly is a re result of the failure to imitate those we least resemble. Mm -hmm. And I felt that Baldwin for a time was playing to the black cultural nationalist when he clearly was not. I mean, he was a race man, but he wasn't a cultural nationalist. Mm -hmm. Think about that paragraph that I recited. It's mm -hmm. all about nuance. Mm -hmm. You know, each of us contains the other. Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, I think he got his voice back again at the very end, and then he died. Mm -hmm. he, so what is it about his prose that speaks mm -hmm. to you, that makes him relevant, not only to you, but to so many of us mm -hmm. today, do you think? Mm -hmm. Well, Morrison, when she wrote about him after he had, had died, she talked about Baldwin giving her the gifts of tenderness, language, and courage. I think she gave us those gifts as well. And so I, I agree with her. Um, there is a tenderness in his writing, courage, mm. and uh, language, um, and, and again, you know, particularly in the essays. And for me, you know, again, going back to, I, I lived in France, and so the essays that he wrote in France have a special resonance. We didn't live at, in France at the same time. Um, but there is this, and, and his, his visits to Africa as well. So I really identify in that sense with his kind of Pan-African view. And so many, you know, Cory Booker is in this book, and Cory Booker's memoir, and like almost every other chapter begins with a quote from Baldwin. Yeah. Um, Margaret Busby, the legendary B British publisher, she knew Baldwin, and she knew Baldwin's brother, David. Um, so there's all this, Baldwin definitely runs through, um, you know, many of them, uh, the people that I, that I write about. Do you know people he's about to announce his engagement? Who's about to? Corey. R really? <laughs> <laughs> is this public knowledge? It uh, is... It's um, a bit too late now. It's not a secret, and <laughs> there is a big... Uh, uh, how I'm just like, Corey, how come I don't know this? <laughs> well, I did. Oh, well, you, we, we're, you on Zoom, you, you, yeah. we're on Zoom, aren't we? We're on Zoom. Oh, well, I'll tell you dinner. Okay. I'll tell you dinner. <laughs> I don't want to be accused, though, of spilling 
uh, the beans. But okay, I think you just kind of spilt them a little bit. Well, no, I, I, that's not a, a, a big thing. But the identity of, oh. of the person to whom he's engaged. Can I'll we have dinner right now? I'll tell you. <laughs> I'll tell you. I'll, I will um, tell you uh, at dinner. I promise. Okay. And there, <laughs> about half of you are coming. Um, now I want you to read from um, um, from th this marvelous collection. But before that, um, how does it differ for you as an interviewer and writer to connect with an international treasure like Toni Morrison and a local personal hero like the uh, uh, centenarian, yeah. uh, Mrs. Harris? Mm -hmm. um, well, there's, there's no difference. They were all, whether one is a celebrity or not, and maybe this is the pastor's kid, um, just all fabulous, fabulous lives. Um, I think I do have a special draw. I'm drawn to older people, um, and maybe that's as a result of growing up in Nigeria, and, you know, again, I don't want to essentialize cultures, and but definitely much more of a reverence for older age. And um, I don't, I'm just in my, even in my novels and so forth, I'm drawn to an older voice. And I mean, someone like Willard Harris, she's actually doing an event right now, some honoring of, you know, some nurses associations. So I couldn't attend her event. Um, <laughs> but she's in, in many respects, she feels often younger than me. Um, she has such a young spirit. She's always eager to learn. Yeah, so. Well, I'm so glad that you, I love the, first of all, it's an honor ju to just to be in this uh, company. And I love the people that, uh, I admired each of, each of uh, th these people. Um, you can read, of course, whatever you want, but if, if I could ask, yes. could you set the stage for your own essay on your journey to the South Pole and perhaps read a passage or, or two from it if you're comfortable doing that, but if not, anything you want. So the, the book is bookended with two personal essays, one that I've talked about, uh, Notes of a Native Daughter, with a very reverent bow to Baldwin, and then the last uh, chapter is entitled The White Continent, and this is based on a trip that I took uh, about a year ago to the South Pole. And um, I think if I read from the beginning, it sort of speaks for itself, but I, I, I wanted to end the the book with this essay, in part because this was a continent that's physically, it's white, it's, it's ice, ice, ice. <laughs> and um, it's, I didn't know very much about the continent before I went. I didn't even know how it was governed by a coalition of countries that ensure that no military exercises happen, no mining takes place, um, only scientific research is done I mean, it's an incredible model for what we can do as humans if we come together. Um, and when you're, when you're on that continent, especially when you go in, well, even on the coast, I presume, but we went into the interior, you're so bundled up, you don't see, you can't tell if someone is black, white, what gender they are. You know, it's just you're human, um, just to see another human. <laughs> and so I reference um, Zora Neale Hurston, another, you know, you're such expertise there. In uh, her essay, What It Feels Like to Be Colored Me, she, uh, to paraphrase, says that um, she feels most colored when thrown against a stark white background. Mm. And here I was on the continent feeling not the most colored, not the most black, but the most human. Huh. Um, so I thought you were going to say the most frozen. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, you see, you always, you, 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 yeah. How does it feel yes. to be frozen meat? <laughs> <laughs> um, so I'm going to read, it's a little long, but I think um, it, it's two and a half pages, no, three pages. Um, oh, no, read I it all, it's great, it's okay. beautiful. So, of course, it starts with Dear Willard. Willard, I go for weekly walks with her. Um, I spoke to her last night, and Julian was in on the conversation. Um, and she's, you know, I always have to boast about her age because people see us walking and they probably think she's like 70 or 80. And I say like, do you know, she's 103. And she laughs. She says, all I have to do is walk around the block and I'm a rock star. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so we start the white continent. And I'm speaking to Willard 
guess what? I just got invited to travel to the South Pole. Get out of here. Get out of here. <laughs> you think I should go? It feels like such a crazy thing to do. You go, girl. Go. How often black folks like us get a chance to do something like this? I <laughs> wish I could go, but I might be too old, huh? After weeks of feeling torn over whether to accept a friend's generous invitation to join a South Pole expedition, weighing everything from excitement to worrying about the cold, from traveling during a pandemic to the ex extravagance of such a trip, it's the voice of my friend Willard, at that time a 102-year-old African-American woman, that convinces me to go. Antarctica, January 13th, 2022. 30, 20, 10. I can hear the countdown from the cockpit, and then comes the bump as we hit the blue ice runway, speeding forward, rattling and lurching to the left, to the right. I hold my breath and hold it, hold it, hold it, until I feel the plane begin to slow. And then, with relief, I join in a burst of applause. We have landed in Antarctica. <laughs> when it's my turn to disembark, I do so tentatively, weighed down by a heavy polar coat and boots. The little of me that isn't at least triple wrapped, namely my nose, feels the sharp prick of cold as I squint in the blinding light, taking in a blue ice rink that stretches as far as my eyes can see. We have landed on a long strip of glacial ice blown free of snow. Next to it are two storage containers, several large drums of jet fuel roped together, and two snow vehicles which add a bright pop of orange and blue to the pale blue ice and white snow. Even with sunglasses, everything here is bright, too bright. The sun, the ice, the snow. I glance back down at my massive black boots and the slick ice and brace myself. The air is filled with ice crystals within which my breath turns to white puffs. Mm. With each step, my clothes make shuffling noises, half astronaut, half matryoshka nesting doll. My outer layer is a long, bright red polar jacket worn over heavily insulated black trousers. Beneath these, I wear three more layers. We have stepped outside for just a few minutes, so the additional recommended layers another fleece top, a windproof jacket plus neck gaiter, balaclava, and extra heavyweight woolen socks remain in my duffel bag for when we get to camp further inland. <laughs> but now, despite my layers, my legs have started to shiver and won't stop. It feels like malaria, but this is no illness, just cold, damn cold. So cold that here, some 80 miles into Antarctica's interior, there are no birds, insects or vegetation. With the exception of the three humans here to meet us, there is no life. The snow cat, which will take us 22 miles further inland, looks like a small school bus with four giant triangular tracks for wheels. I climb in through the back stairs, glancing at our luggage, which is stacked up amidst fine trails of snow and ice. There are 15 of us, including my husband, expedition guides, and glaciologists. Outside, the snow-covered peaks look like meringues, and on the white, white snow, our vehicle's shadow is the same royal blue as the sky. As we set off, our expedition guide explains how the route has been mapped out ahead of time with ground-penetrating sonar to detect any cracks in the ice. These crevasses, which run as deep as 60 meters and as wide as nine meters, are invisible to the naked eye when lightly filled with snowdrift. As such, whenever we stop, we're advised not to wander beyond the demarcated route. Our glaciologist, who has lost colleagues to crevasses, mm. once had a narrow escape himself. If you hit one, he advises Riley, hope to fall deep and hard, as there's little chance of being rescued. We journey for another two hours, passing the Ellsworth mountain range, whose peaks are completely submerged beneath glacial ice and snow. Occasionally, bare granite peaks called nunataks protrude from the ice like a monument from another era. The absence of life makes it feel both extraterrestrial and prehistoric. 
It's hard to even imagine what this place would be like without the thick blanket of ice. Yet, 90 million years ago, dinosaurs roamed the continent in temperate rainforests. I begin to think in geological time. Growing up, I didn't know that Antarctica was the world's largest polar desert and the size of India and China combined. But I did know something about deserts. I lived in the northern city of Jos, Nigeria, 1,500 miles from the Sahara Desert. And during Harmattan season, the winds brought in the fine cinnamon Saharan dust. I was mesmerized by tales of the Sahara, its vastness, the extreme heat, the beauty and terror of it, but most of all, by stories of its nomadic peoples. Antarctica's polar desert feels analogous in terms of its striking beauty and lurking terrors, but it's bigger, much bigger, cold and empty. In the weeks leading up to the trip, I followed a spate of articles about Antarctica's melting sea ice and wondered what visible marks of climate change I might see. Friends had asked, only half jokingly, if I were taking the trip before all the ice melted. And to my surprise, our glaciologist explains that Antarctica's ice, at least its interior ice, as opposed to the ice shelves on the coast, will not melt anytime soon. The ice, I learn, is on average two kilometers deep. Two kilometers deep. Contrary to what I'd expected, the continent's interior is one of the few places on Earth that looks almost exactly the same as it did thousands of years earlier. The surface feels so pristine that I have nothing to compare it to beyond make-believe landscapes that I associate with toothpaste or chewing gum ads, all bright, clean, and twinkly. Ironically, unlike other parts of the world, such as where I live in California, here it's the absence of visible change that makes me want to do more to preserve what we have. I find myself thinking of how much of the environmental crisis messaging is, of necessity, apocalyptic in tone, sea levels rising, ice shelves collapsing. And yet now I wonder if such messaging may be doomed without some hope or inspiration. Instead of presenting visible signs of warming, Antarctica is a picture of what unspoiled, pristine environments can look like. It's a stark reminder that while our human species might perish, Earth will continue to exist on its own terms. The planet doesn't need us to exist. We need it. Ah, beautiful. So. That's beautiful. Um, one more question, then we'll open it up. Right, Abby? Um, so who's missing from who? You know, was there a, a person you couldn't just um, schedule them uh, or they got sick or something, which is another way of saying, um, will there be a volume two? <laughs> <laughs> um, perhaps. I mean, hundreds and thousands are missing and some are in this room. Perhaps many are in this room. I was listening to your talk with Darren Walker. Um, I'd love to have a section focusing on philanthropy, those working within philanthropy, um, and you know, maybe he would go in there and someone like Strive Nasiwa. Um, uh, Angela Davis, you just did this wonderful conversation with her. That was that, great. That was so amazing. You know, she, uh, you know, I'm, there are a lot of people that I mentioned in the introductory chapter. Um, uh, there's, there's so many, I'm gonna highlight one or two people in the room as well, but I will say back to the W.E.B. Du Bois Awards, ceremony, everybody, everybody that's been <laughs> honored um, should, you know, I'd love to, to be in conversation. But then, I mean, I'm also thinking about people that I've been lucky enough to meet. So Yanis Sassentikumpo, for example, oh, I yeah. met in the summer and, um, you know, I'd love to spend more time getting to know him and uh, being in conversation with him. So that's a sports person. There are no sports people in this book. Um, you know, so many have been mentees of yours, someone like Elizabeth Alexander. Um, and uh, yeah, and I'm looking, my eye is drawn to someone, um, Courage Tudula. How do you pronounce your last name? Podo. Okay, K-P-O-D-O. Um, and correct me if I'm wrong, 
Um, he's here at MIT and in architecture, and he's just been selected for the Venice Architectura uh, 2023. I think you're the youngest ever. Uh, you're originally, you come from Ghana. Um, and so I've been lucky enough to meet him once or twice. Um, I would love to. So this is the future Starshine. That's and great. So, That's um, great. This, David Ajay uh, yeah. coming, right? <laughs> yeah, so congratulations. You what? Oh, you worked with David? Oh, good. Good. Yeah. No, yeah. congratulations. Give it up to this young boy. Good. Um, so will, are you planning it, uh, volume two? Do you think I should? Absolutely. I think we all should. Shouldn't she? Okay. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> Good. Questions? Let's open it up. This is the way I started with her is how I start with my guests on Finding Your Roots. Mm. How about that? I'm honored. And then after four hours of climbing the branches of their family tree, I always end with the same question. Who are your people mm. now? Mm. How about that? Questions? Comments? Yes. You're, you're a tough act to follow here asking a question, <laughs> but <laughs> you know, if we do a little twist on the cliche saying with great, not power, but access comes responsibility. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit about how you might have felt the burden as well as the excitement of that responsibility of having access to these people, to these intimate conversations to these insights, you know, almost as if you've been handed a, a fragile thing, a precious gift. What kind of responsibility did that feel like? It's a good question, and maybe it would feel differently with everyone. So this is Hollis, who I was lucky enough to meet. Uh, she's a writer and based in Amsterdam, so all the way from Amsterdam, further than down the road. Oh. Um, um, <laughs> I mean, certainly I felt that weight, even though I'd only, uh, the only meeting I had with Toni Morrison, unlike the others in the, in the collection, was just once in person. Um, but I think I felt the most nervous, not so much about being in conversation. Um, I think maybe that was just a credit to her. She's very warm and made, uh, as the two of us made us feel at home, but writing about her, like how do you write Yeah, that's about what I mean Morrison? in terms of what you create from those conversations. That's where the responsibility yeah. thing. Do you do justice to it? I took, um, I took courage from something that Toni Morrison said in her Nobel lecture, and I don't know if I can recite it, um, but so let me just say I'm paraphrasing. She says in the course of her Nobel lecture, which I revisit yearly, it's such a powerful <laughs> lecture, um, something to the effect of one can never pin down um, war, um, slavery, difficult things in language, but it's the reach towards the ineffable that matters. So that, that's kind of how I'm paraphrasing. And so I keep thinking about the reach towards the ineffable I just try, try to do the conversation or the essay justice. Um, and then um, in terms of responsibility, some of, some of these, half of the, the chapters in the book, including Skip's chapter, were conversations that I did for the Museum of the African Diaspora during COVID. And so I felt that I, I, I'm lucky enough to know some of these amazing, remarkable people. And so to bring that to a museum while their doors were closed was a way of sort of raising awareness and also um, raising some funds. And, um, you know, similarly in a small way, I, any author proceeds for this book will go towards supporting artists. So in the initial year to the Museum of the African Diaspora and Hedgebrook, which supports um, women's mm -hmm. voices, women identified voices. Um, so in those ways, um, feeling that one is hopefully giving back and, and encouraging all the new starshine that we have. <laughs> yeah. Beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Next question. Hi, thank you. That was so beautiful. Um, you talked about France and what an impression it made on you. Mm. 
And I guess in a follow-up of um, the question about who's not in the book, mm. Mm. there aren't. Mm. Uh, if you could put French or French Caribbean figures in the book, mm. who might you choose, mm -hmm. and what would you want that to bring to the world? Mm -hmm. mm. Yeah, I mean, you know, unfortunately, this is just a. F you know, I can't cover everything. It's just a few, a few voices. Um, I would have to give that some more thought, and I would want to also um, read up and learn about, you know, more about who's doing what now. Uh, Marie Condé comes to mind. Um, I, you know, I read her work early on and revisiting it recently. I would love suggestions. And uh, again, these are, you know, I'm thinking about people that I've had some kind of encounters with. So I had encounters with her writing and we served on uh, a publication on an advisory board together. Um, and we're bringing so her here in back in, in April. Oh, So you can well, come. Why don't you come and be our guest okay. and then you can interview her. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> First interview for volume two. C'est super. Yeah. Uh, yeah, but I, yeah, so. She's from Guadeloupe. Mm -hmm. For those of you who don't mm -hmm. know, what a great novelist. Mm -hmm. But really good point. Yeah. Who would you suggest? Uh, there's an, uh, an amazing scholar, Man Sassy Young, who's writing uh, about France at the moment mm -hmm. and how it feels to be a black female scholar in France mm -hmm. in a context where sometimes in the English space and very body is a challenge to the structures mm -hmm. that operate in that space. I think mm -hmm. she would be an amazing. And then historical figures, uh, Betsy Bates has done some work on Josephine Baker. So in an imaginary sort of yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. If we could go Josephine back in time, yeah. 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 Would you include North Africa? Yeah, absolutely, yeah. And also Tahar Benjamin. Tahar, yes. And I've loved, uh, Corruption was a book that I liked a lot. A little Latin yeah. America, Abby said. So yeah. Abby, I'm coming to you for that. <laughs> Okay. Yeah. D1. Yes. Thank you very much for this talk and for this book. Um, to piggyback on Skip's initial question, uh, I thought it was a powerful way to start the conversation asking who are your people and to hear you exploring you know, your past and whatnot. Um, I'm curious, what was your mother's approach towards teaching you about your ethnicity, your identity. I'm curious, what was her vantage point mm -hmm. uh, in, in terms of how she either preferred for you to refer to yourself or how she uh, taught you about both sides of you know, what, what uh, makes up your background? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This is a great question. Anthony Appiah writes about that uh, mm -hmm. quite a lot. Mm -hmm. I mean, again, you know, back to Nigeria, it was, perhaps other facets of my identity, like being a pastor's child and being a Christian and, um, you know, in being a Muslim Yoruba. area, in a Muslim well, town. Well, it was quite mixed, actually. It was, it was, it was mixed, yeah, it was mixed. Um, and so I think, you know, my mother, my mother first and foremost, I'd say, raised my brother and I to, she did everything she could to make sure we had great books to read. I wouldn't say that she would necessarily think about whether the authors were black or white, but just to make sure, you know, all her energies into making sure we had the best possible education, that we were confident in ourselves. Um, in a way, my mother was the outside and my mother was the Oyingbo um, in Nigeria. Everyone else was black. Um, so if anything, she was, you know, maybe telling us more about York and, and, and England because I was surrounded by, by black people. And, and you know, I, um, so yeah, I think, I think her emphasis, at least in our young childhood until teenagers when, we, when I left and to, to move to, to, to Kenya and then to England, um, was trying to do all she could to make sure we were just secure in ourselves. Um, and I think it was harder for her when we moved to England and I became more conscious of race um, and would start referring to her as my white mother. Mm -hmm. And 
she found that hard. Um, and, you know, we would go, like to this day, when we, when we are together, no one assumes that we are connected. Um, we'll go shopping and it's always like, okay, you, you know, separate the two of us. Um, and so we've had a lot of discussions over the years about race and racial identity. And I wrote a piece um, kind of uh, related to my son, Julian, coming of age in the time of a hoodie. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that reading that piece was quite a revelation to her of what it's like to raise a black son in, in America. Um, and I, in, in fact, in that piece, I include an anecdote um, that, you know, I ran the piece by my mother to make sure she was okay with me sharing it. But I remember um, there was a, Julian had drawn a self portrait of himself and my mother's reaction, this is also my mother's, and, and you know, sort of her Yorkshire sense of humor said something like, oh, it looks like a real mugshot, you know, don't show anyone this picture. And I, I you know, and I, that upset me and like, well, what, what do you, what do you mean? Like this young black man image and that's your reaction. Um, so yeah, so we've had, we've had lots of conversations. Um, but if my mother yeah. or father, my, my father, my parents were legally black, my father looked white. But if they had said that an image was a mugshot, it wouldn't have had anything to do with the, it just meant you didn't smile, right. you know, or like, I mean, I have a mugshot, <laughs> as you might have heard. Yeah. And it's not the happiest moment when, when they put you up against that thing. So that she could have been referred to, to That's what could have been hard on this innocent person. You should be ashamed. I, well, I know. I, She's sorry, Mama. Right, right. Yeah, no, I know. I, but, th I mean, you're making the exact point that she would make, exactly. Um, <clears throat> but for her to understand how that came across, <clears throat> or would come across in this context. Um, <laughs> yeah. But she got the England and said, oh my God, my daughter's turned into uh, Angela Davis, the revolutionary. <laughs> it's so fascinating. Anthony's m mother, uh, be because her parents uh, got married, Anthony's parents got married in the 50s. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And when uh, his mother was the daughter of Sir Stafford Cripps, so when they were married, it was headlines in the London Times and New York Times mm -hmm. everywhere. Mm -hmm. So that she had to, I don't think she had any choice but to feed them stories about being black. Hmm. She read to them, mm -hmm. James Baldwin, mm -hmm. uh, all kind of, you know, er er everything. Mm -hmm. she, was, she was like a black history mm -hmm. uh, teacher for them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. But it sounds like your parents were much more anonymous in, in Johnson. Or yeah, I mean, you know, I've also got to realize I, every Sunday I heard my father's sermons. So all the stories I heard, you know, I, I heard my father's sermons. I, 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 I was just surrounded by um, the stories that I would hear from my classmates and the people that were around me in the community in different languages as well. I wouldn't necessarily understand all the languages. You know, I, started, I was hearing Hausa, I was hearing Yoruba. So it was a very rich, multilingual, multicultural in the old sense that would have been used in those days. Um, like really multicultural, Nigerian multicultural as well. Um, so I think this is another thing to stress that, again, the Yoruba, the Igbo, the Hausa, Fulani, very different cultures in many ways. Uh, so it's one country, but um, so I had all of that swirling around. Um, but that's a very important thing for you to write about. I mean, it's a real lesson for Americans, you know, you mean there's something more important than black and white? Oh my God. And how, what, was important about your complex identity, how that changed, mm -hmm. you know? Well, in Nigeria, this was more important than I was Yoruba, let's mm -hmm. say, or mm -hmm. more important than that my mother was English, and in England, it was more important that my father was black, or whatever mm -hmm. that might be. That would be a marvelous, mm -hmm. um, a great lesson for mm -hmm. people to understand mm -hmm. about the, as it were, the subjectivity of one's subjectivity you know, the uh, ones, mm -hmm. how identity is social, socially mm -hmm. constructed. And, and as soon as you get on a plane, mm -hmm. um, the, um, the salient markers mm -hmm. change. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 
Hello, You're thank next. you so much. Um, I wanted to ask perhaps the inverse of D1's question, yeah. which is understanding more of how your father helped shape your identity. And I know perhaps um, the way some people grow up, they're closer to their mothers, or their mothers are at home more, and maybe the mother is more the culture bearer. So I'm curious, mm -hmm. in your early years, when you were in Nigeria, when you're in this multicultural environment, in the place where your father is from, the ways in which your identity as Yoruba was accentuated or not, and how he related to you being uh, mixed race in this context, and how that, like the gender component of that, and if that was relevant at all. Just mm -hmm. curious if you could share some reflections. That's a good there. question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, all these questions, I feel I want to just sit with them for a while and really think through them. Um, the first thing that came to mind when you asked ab me about my father is that he has uh, his, he, his daily practice of, of spending time praying. And so I think that was maybe the strongest message I got when I was young, that he's always, every day he prays for his children. Um, and he that needs to be praying for his grandson. <laughs> and his grandkids too. Um, and I, you know, I, I think again the strongest message for me was obviously my father's a, a an Anglican vicar, and his faith is very important. And he would like to sort of, you know, have more people uh, share his faith. But a real tolerance and acceptance and embracing of multi faiths, and that was not necessarily the norm. So that was a very strong message to me. And again, in the context of Nigeria at the time as well, a very strong message about um, corruption and being uh, upright and honest. And you know, we, I, you know, I, we were, we didn't have very much money. We never had. You know, I was going to school with people who were, you know, um, their parents were in the military or in the government, and. We always had like secondhand cars and secondhand clothes, and you know, and I, so I, you know, as a young child, I was always kind of not always, but looking at everyone else who always seemed to have a much more sparkly life. And <laughs> my my father's and parents' insistence, my father raised his own support, so we never knew how much money we would get from time to time. So I think I'm 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 talking more about sort of life lessons and also his um, insistence on. You know, we're, we're all created equal in the eyes of God, no matter what station we hold in life or who we are. And so I think those lessons uh, were embedded in me from the very beginning and, and have stayed with me. He had his hand up. Thank you. Uh, you mentioned um, living in um, Kenya, Nigeria. Mm -hmm. And my question goes to if you could speak to how you are treated or you're being light-skinned or white adjacent, or let's just call it white, in, in, in terms of how Africans perceive you. And I was wondering whether there's any variation in the way that um, you're treated, say, in Kenya and Nigeria. And I'm asking this because uh, different African countries have different experiences with European colonization, some were settler. You know, states, some yeah. were non settler mm -hmm. states. And sometimes other scholars have argued whether this then shapes how they relate to mm -hmm. whiteness or in East mm -hmm. Africa, Mzungu. So mm -hmm. I'm kind of just wondering if there's a variation in the way that mm -hmm. you were perceived mm -hmm. in uh, different African countries, mm -hmm. namely here, Kenya, and Nigeria. Excellent question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, you're right. And um, so a place like Nigeria didn't have a history of settler colonialism in the same way that somewhere like Kenya. Um, or the apartheid um, historical situations that you have in South Africa or in Zimbabwe. And so I write about this in the introductory chapter, um, that uh, particularly going to Southern Africa was a revelation for me, and suddenly I encounter a new category of colored um, that you had as a uh, leftover from the apartheid period. Um, so, yeah, and, and you know, in Nigeria, even though I was uh, 
from the way I looked, although I'm much darker. If I spend a few weeks in Nigeria, I do get, <laughs> I do get a little bit darker, well, quite a bit darker. Um, but the fact that I could speak pidgin English, so there's also a linguistic thing that helps then that kind of even things out. Then I, then I, then I was still slightly Oyimbo, but you know, if I could just you know, blend in linguistically, then you know, that was different. And I, so I, I noticed the same sort of thing also in Southern Africa, um, speaking, Speaking the language, I, I don't speak Shona or anything, but if, if there are that language and ability to to uh, shrink the divide or the the space between helps. Um, and Kenya, you're from Kenya. <laughs> how do we how did we know? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I mean, yeah, and Kenya's history with, with the British is something. Wyndham, Wyndham, Wyndham Lewis famously wrote that an Englishman is born branded on the tongue. Who, who said that? Wyndham Lewis. Okay, okay. Uh, and, so, and you have an Oxonian accent. When you say you have an upper class English accent. My accent moves. Well, you can pull it out when you need it. Oh yes. <laughs> and you. It's also the you know the way that one holds oneself. It's true, but more important than all of that is the way you pronounce the, now the king's English, don't you think? Do you? Th well, let me ask a question. Do you think that's true? I still am finding it difficult to get over the king business. <laughs> I know, <laughs> King Charles. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's a whole other subject. Yeah. What about all these years later? Uh, this is something I've, I've interviewed Wally Schenck at least half a dozen times. And sometimes I ask him the same. I mean, if you looked at the, all the questions over I I these, collectively over these six or seven uh, interviews, maybe half I've asked him six or seven times. And the, and the answers change and, and they morph. And one is, um, Does basically, what happened to the hope of Africa? I was 10 years old in 1960 when, was it 17 African, I always forget, if Emmanuel Chompong was here, he would, anybody can fact check, I think it's 17 African nations became independent. In 1960. Or no, yeah, 1960. Mm -hmm. And there was so much hope. Mm -hmm. Fanon, in eight years before he'd written about the new man, and there was a lot of that new man business, you know, that we were going to be different, that there was going to be a United States of Africa, maybe, mm -hmm, even. Mm -hmm. um, optimistic, pessimistic about the future of, of the motherland. Well, in part, that's what drove me to write my first novel, Independence. Um, uh, the motherland is big. It depends where we're, what we're talking about. Um, Nigeria is a mess right now. It's worrying, actually. Um, that's a, a bigger, bigger conversation. Um, I'm always, I like to always be hopeful <laughs> and, and optimistic and yeah. glass half full, but... Uh, that's your personality. That's yeah, your there, character. There but it's, when I, I love South Africa, but when I... Yeah. I mean, I've been to 20 at least African countries, and I, I love going... Africa, and I love, obviously I've been in Nigeria more than, I lived in Tanzania when I was 19, I turned 20 in the village. Mm -hmm. um, and I've been to Nigeria more because of Shoyinka mm -hmm. than any other place. Mm -hmm. But I love South Africa, I love Cape Town, I love, there's a, uh, a seaside town called Kalk Bay that mm -hmm. I, I mm -hmm. love, if I were Oprah, I'd commute, you know, in my G5, right? <laughs> I liked it so much, it reminds me of Martha's Vineyard. <laughs> But when, when I land, I'm so happy. And then you drive past all of this poverty, getting to wherever your hotel is. And, and you just think, oh my God, can this country that I love so much, um, can it survive the class divisions? And now and then we see the, the xenophobia against, it used to be Nigerians, now it's fr people from Zim. Uh, yeah. And you go, oh my God, you know what? Mm -hmm. What, yeah. what can be done, so. Yeah, 
and the economic disparities like throughout the world uh, growing wider and wider. And they're so yeah. dramatic. When, <laughs> when many of my friends in Nigeria and Ghana and um, in South Africa, just to pick three, and live in armed compounds. They don't even realize it. Till they can't jog you know, in their neighborhoods easily. Uh, their guards at the end of the block and barbed wire and guards at, at the house. It's just a very claustrophobic. And my wife, who's Cuban and used to open, nobody has guns in, in Cuba. I'm not commanding this. Um, Cuba is a way of life. But the state controls the guns for obvious reasons, right? So uh, this is not a question of can you, you know, jog or walk around uh, or anything like that. So the first time I took her to Africa, she found the whole thing very, very claustrophobic because of this need to protect oneself against, you know, being robbed. Um, and it is claustrophobic. This great, open, beautiful continent for the 1%. The 1% live a very closed life. When I've filmed in Africa, which I've done several times, you know, you met at the airport in Nigeria, an armed guard, you know, armed guard in front of you, armed guard behind you, because people would steal the cameras. It's, you know, I'm not trying to generalize, I'm just saying yeah. this has actually happened yeah. to me with a film crew. But at the same time, I mean, one thing that I'm really excited about is just the arts, the film, the literature, the fashion, yeah. the architects, the, you know, the, so, you know, I, I think we have to also highlight what is really exciting. Absolutely. And, um, yeah. So I want less of the former, more of the latter, yeah. less of the former, so that the latter can, can thrive, you know, more beautifully, mm -hmm. more mm -hmm. gloriously. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Are there any place in Africa that give you hope? Any countries that uh, you find where democracy is thriving or class differences are less stark? People often point to Botswana, for example. Yeah, I mean, I, I, it's, um, I haven't, I was just come back from Zimbabwe uh, last month, but I feel that with COVID and so forth, I haven't spent a lot of time in the continent uh, over the last few years, so I don't feel best in the best position to say. Um, but I think there's hope. There's so much talent. There's so many, um, you know, it's a, it's a young continent. So that gives me hope across the board. Um, it's just a question of making it work. And um, in many cases, those who are the older generation uh, stepping aside and giving, giving more just giving the younger generation greater voice, which is not to say that the youth will necessarily solve everything, but I do think there is a lot of potential. And um, well, we used to say that in the United States, and then we got Donald Trump. <laughs> yeah. Maybe he's older, and we're waiting for him to go. <laughs> my God, we can't end on that note. <laughs> Jeez, with Donald Trump on my lips. Oh, question over there. Yes. Question back there, please. Could you stand up, please, so we could see you, if you don't mind? Okay, thank you very much for the lovely talk. So in your book, you mentioned how your education was very missionary, and you didn't have access to Nigerian literature or languages, and it's only when you came across Wale's Mamwa where you got a indication of Nigeria's past, like a window into Nigeria's past. So would you say that the educational systems have changed since then? So I went to an American missionary school. So um, you've got to understand in that context, I didn't go to uh, a local government school. Um, I did have access to Nigerian languages just all around me. Um, but I think the point that I was making in my piece was that I wasn't taught African languages and I wasn't reading African literature as a young child. Um, and I hope, and that has changed even in schools that are not local government schools. Um, and uh, yeah, and I think, again, I'm not up to speed on this, but Nigeria is also uh, trying to bring in 
local languages in, in terms of language of instruction, which is, it, it's a great idea, but unfortunately the, the books and textbooks are not there. So um, there are also sometimes a mismatch of maybe some good ideas that you can't, you can't, you can't start it without mm -hmm. having the, <laughs> the infrastructure and those who can teach and the textbooks and so forth. Um, so, yeah, <coughs> speaking specifically for us Nigeria. Have you two met before? The person? No, no, <coughs> I, I recognize you. Oh, yeah. She happens to be the man you can find. Yes, I see. <coughs> <laughs> yes, Thank in you. the back. Last question, I think, right, Abby? I think so, yes. We have to take this. Sure, hi, hi Michael. I wondered if you could talk about, you're, you're an Anglo-Nigerian American writer, novelist, and I was curious about whether the reception for your two novels have been different in, uh, <laughs> yes, in, the, in, uh, in the different places that you're, that you're from. Yeah. So I've, um, the book came out in England in uh, last year, October. Um, I haven't gone to Nigeria <coughs> or <coughs> talked to um, anyone in Zimbabwe yet about the book. Uh, I think there's the obvious people in England are more familiar with someone like Margaret Busby um, and Lord Michael Hastings, for example, than people would be here. Um, but then that said, people also know of, of Skip Gates and <laughs> the, the, the star Americans. Um, I think there's a general interest in Willard Harris. Uh, so she's someone that no one necessarily knew her name. She's a 103-year-old. Um, and I've had lots of people ask, you know, what, what, is she, what advice does she give? So there's sort of a hunger for how does one live one's life. Um, I, there's a lot more attention in America to race um, as a defining social construct, obviously. I'm um, trying to think of things that people, perhaps in England, more questions about the, those who are from Africa, like Wally Shoyinka um, and <coughs> Margaret Busby and Koli Sositole. And, uh, yeah, so I think it's, it's sort of regional differences, what, you know, Europe being a little bit closer geographically and so forth to Africa, perhaps. Um, yeah, um, a lot of people asking, you know, what's a black person doing in the South Pole? <laughs> that, that's a, a universal question. Um, yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, oh, fa final question from Brazil. Oh. We're going to pan Africa yeah. here. Good evening. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah, um, for talking. Uh, I'm delighted with your book. Thank you, thank you. I need to read it um, uh, with prof Professor Gates. Talk. I am Brazilian. I am writer, artist, and anthropologist, and I am fellow in Hunt Center. I write books about uh, what has been and become black women in Brazil today. Then, um, my question is about uh, the concept of body ar archive appear in your book. If it is, y uh, if yes, how does it influence if you belong to an ethnic group or not? But <laughs> maybe uh, to be more deep in, how do you Rela relate to your body archive, body memory. Whoa. Sorry. <laughs> how do I? Sorry. So I understood the second part. How, how do? But there was something that prefaced it. How do I relate to my body memory, body archive? Body. You mean her ethnic, her ethnic or racial identity, or how? 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 Okay. Mm -hmm. It's very, very um, uh, difficult. 
song uh, is very um, present in my heart. Mm -hmm. How the work I talk about um, influence the world. Yeah, your yeah. corporal yeah. archive, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. Meaning mm -hmm. your multiple identities. Mm -hmm. And the, the question being? How do you relate to that? The multiplicity mm -hmm. of that. I mean, you've already mm -hmm. established mm -hmm. that you have multiple, you know, you have to remember in Brazil, there are 134 categories of blankness. Mm -hmm. You've already said mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. you, you've lived in three, at least three different places where being black or white, mixed race was not the most important thing mm -hmm. that defined you. That when mm -hmm. people looked at you, these were not the boxes that they, other people are checking mm -hmm. when they're mm -hmm. seeing you. Mm -hmm. Somebody checked you as an Algerian. Mm -hmm. Somebody mm -hmm. checks you as a, a Yoruba. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Somebody in England checks you as black, without a doubt. Mm -hmm. um, you know, walking, who's this white lady? Mm -hmm. uh, in San Francisco, you're an African. Mm -hmm. So that's four identities right there. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, this, again, like so many questions, deserves more thought and um, mulling over, but I think my initial response is just a celebration of these different facets and identity, and it allows me, I think it gives, me, because I have lived in different continents and been in different situations <coughs> and been perceived differently and um, stayed in enough time in places to understand the social constructions of, uh, of race in different places, it gives me um, just a genuine interest in learning more, in, in bringing different stories together, as I've done in this book. So someone asked about France, and my mind also went to a place like Brazil, um, that, that you know, there is a whole other African diasporic experience. And so, that, so I think what I have lived and the, the, the embodying of different identities and both my lived experience and my uh, the experience of uh, teaching and researching and history, d it, it drives my passion and my interest in this field. And um, so I, I celebrate it um, because I think it leads me to a place where I want to learn more and I want, as, I want these stories to be more accessible, um, these stories of everywhere to be more accessible to the world. And of course, my instinct is to want to come and ask you more questions about your own work. Uh, so. Well, you have, you have a chance at dinner. Mm -hmm. Let's give it up for it, my friend Sarah. <laughs> <Lee Lisa Cruz. laughs> That's Thank wonderful. you. Thank now, you, um, you want to yeah. sign some books? Okay, everybody, yeah. you can't get out of here unless you buy books. <laughs> oh, and, and so the other thing is, uh, so it's a celebration of the, the 12 main people in this book, but it's a celebration of all of us and the collective star shine. So this is a book that I've carried, it's a copy of the book without the cover, that I've carried around and I would love everyone to sign it um, as the collective star shine. You don't need to say anything, some people have said nice things. You can sign on whatever page you want to, but for me, this is, this is my star shine. I carry it around with me, my copy of the book signed by you. So you don't need to buy a book, but I would love you to sign my book. So. You, well, you can do that out there as right. you buy the book. <laughs> <laughs> Ignore all that. <laughs> I'm a bully. <laughs>